Hello, my name is Terry Cunningham, and I'm the president of the board of the Liver Coalition of San Diego. I'd like to welcome you to another informational seminar from the Liver Coalition. Uh, and we are providing seminars that deal with all types of liver diseases. We have experts providing very useful information. Um, and we ask you to go to our website if you would like information on other liver diseases and other information that we have posted. Uh, the Liver Coalition was founded last year to fill the void created during the early pandemic. Uh, now all funding raised here in San Diego stays in San Diego and it does not go to a national organization. Uh, again, please look at our website for all types of information about liver diseases and our sponsors, who I would like to introduce now. Uh, first, we have ESI, and we're going to see a short video on them. And next we have Dynavax, and with us tonight are Greg Cohen and Carl Balzante. Thank you, Terry. Uh, it really is a pleasure to be a sponsor of the Liver Coalition and this wonderful education series. Uh, I have Greg Cohen joining me, who is a vaccine specialist with Dynavax. We are a company that has created the very first and only two dose one month hepatitis B vaccine. So tonight we're gonna to learn a lot from Dr. Dicing about the end result when hepatitis uh, becomes a chronic condition. Hopefully taking a vaccine will prevent that and that's what we are out doing every day. Um, Greg, good to see you. You wanna just say a quick hello? Yeah, hello everyone. Thanks for allowing us here to sponsor. Uh, here locally in San Diego, so looking forward to hearing what Dr. Dyson has to say. Great. Thank you, Terry. Thank you. Thank you, guys. And uh, next, we have uh, AbbVie, and we have a short video from them. And I'd like to really thank all of our sponsors. We would not be able to put on these seminars without these wonderful uh, pharmaceutical companies providing us with funding. So thank you very much uh, for your uh, engaging with us. Uh, I would like to remind everyone that uh, today's webinar is for educational purposes only and should not be considered medical advice. Medical advice should only be received from your doctor. Uh, and now I'd like to go ahead and introduce uh, Shirley Tsunoda, who is our 
uh, Associate Medical Advisory Council Chair, and Shirley is going to be the moderator tonight. Hello, Shirley. Hi, Terry. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure to be here, and I just wanted to remind the audience, um, if you have any questions, please go ahead and put them in the chat, and we will um, address those at the end of the webinar. So I'd like to introduce our speaker for tonight, Dr. Adam Dysing. He's a transplant hepatologist at Scripps Green Clinic and Hospital here in La Jolla. And he's gonna talk to us today about, I tested positive for hepatitis B, now what? Dr. Dysing? Thanks, Shirley. Appreciate the, uh, the introduction. Uh, it's wonderful uh, to see everyone and to be here uh, again. Um, uh, Thanks for giving me the opportunity to talk to you about to talk to you about hepatitis B. Um, hepatitis B is something that's near and dear to my heart. Um, I um, spent, as many of you know, I spent many many years in the Navy um, over at the Naval Hospital working as a physician, uh, gastroenterologist and hepatologist over there, and I actually saw quite a bit of hepatitis B. Um, there's a very large uh, Asian, specifically Filipino population uh, in in the Navy, and so um, a lot of my clinic that I saw were people who have had or have been exposed to hepatitis B. So it's something that, that I've uh, spent a lot of time dealing with, um, and I'm happy to share uh, this lecture uh, for everyone to give everyone a little bit uh, better understanding. So hepatitis B, um, uh, very, very prevalent worldwide, uh, not so much as in the United States as, as it is in other parts of the world, uh, but there are anywhere between 750,000 to 2.5 million people in the U.S. with uh, chronic hepatitis B. Most of these people come from Southeast Asia uh, or the Pacific Islands or Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, some come from Eastern Europe. Uh, it is a very common cause of hepata or a hepatocellular carcinoma worldwide. Almost 50 to 55 percent of the cases worldwide of HCC do come from people who have hepatitis B. Um, the vast majority of people with chronic hepatitis B in the U.S. are foreign-born, um, mostly from Asia and Africa, and the um, uh, highest risk of uh, transmission as to how people can get hepatitis B are usually uh, from a maternal to fetal transmission or what's called horizontal exposure from close contacts in very high endemic areas. Uh, for people who are in less endemic areas, such as the United States, uh, the most common way that people get hepatitis B are easier through uh, are usually through uh, either sexual intercourse, um, percutaneous exposure, or some sort of uh, healthcare-associated uh, uh, exposure as well, such as a needle stick. The next several slides um, really kind of hone in on the point of how prevalent this disease is. And so if you have hepatitis B, please know that you are definitely not alone. Um, as I've said for, uh, before, uh, millions of people have hepatitis B worldwide. Uh, really only about 2 million in the United States, uh, however, much more common uh, in, in Asia, specifically Southeast Asia, uh, as well as Eastern Europe. Uh, looking at uh, different uh, diseases and comparing them as to how prevalent the disease is versus diagnosed versus treated, uh, you'll see a big difference here between HIV and hepatitis B. Um, as uh, you know, HIV has uh, been very well known and very well publicized uh, throughout the decades. Many people who have uh, uh, been exposed to hepatitis or HIV have been tested and diagnosed, and many are on treatment because we have very good uh, uh, medications for HIV. Uh, looking at hepatitis C, again, this is a little older slide, and so uh, this is really before we got uh, excellent medications for hepatitis C. I would say that that green circle, which is the uh, number of treated, uh, is much bigger nowadays uh, and, and has filled in that red circle quite a bit. But looking at hepatitis B, you can see that those who are exposed to hepatitis B are much, much larger uh, and uh, uh, fewer are diagnosed uh, compared to how prevalent the disease is and even fewer than that are actually treated um, uh, for hepatitis B. So it is a very big deal uh, in the world. Um, again, uh, another graph showing similar informa uh, information, uh, looking at foreign-born uh, uh, people who live in the United States, um, comparing uh, how many are actually foreign-born and from where they come, and how many of those percentages uh, are actually chronic hepatitis B. And you'll see 
that clearly uh, those who are foreign born from Asia uh, make up the highest percentage of those who have chronic hepatitis B, uh, followed by uh, Central America as well as Africa, and that's usually Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, which is the highest incidence. Uh, looking at uh, the uh, total number of people who have been diagnosed with he uh, hepatitis B who are actually receiving treatment, uh, you will see uh, that, uh, again, it, it varies differently. And specifically looking at the um, uh, Asian Pacific Islanders in the United States, the prevalence was about 8.9%. And of those, really, you know, 830,000 people, only 250,000 were actually diagnosed. And... Uh, uh, about 10% or less than 10% were actually receiving treatment. Again, a uh, similar uh, um, map of the world basically showing where people with chronic hepatitis B come from uh, in the United States, majority from Southeast Asia and Africa. So who gets hepatitis C in the United, uh, United States um, if you're not foreign born? Well, uh, if you're not foreign born, it's uh, many people who are uh, veterans, uh, healthcare professionals, uh, anywhere up to 8%, uh, prisoners, uh, and that's generally because of uh, sharing the needles, drug use that happens in prisons, <clears throat> uh, men who have sex with men just because of the lifestyle and the, the high risk uh, uh, with that. Um, and then, of course, people who inject drugs uh, are also very high risk for uh, hepatitis B as well. Um, we always have to consider co-infection. It's very, very common for uh, people to have hepatitis B to also have HIV or hepatitis C, uh, given the fact that the risk factors for hepatitis B are also the same risk factors for HIV and hep C. And then again, uh, newborns born to hepatitis B infected mothers. Again, that is the most common way that it is transmitted uh, specifically in highly endemic areas. So, um, uh, those who are, uh, have come from high endemic areas, sub, uh, such as Sub-Saharan Africa or uh, the Far East, um, uh, most people get infected either at birth or as a very young child. The primary mode of transmission is what's called um, uh, maternal to fetal or perinatal transmission, which means as the baby is born, it gets exposed to the mother's blood and therefore they get infected. Uh, another way that they get it is through what's called a horizontal uh, transmission, which means just exposure uh, somehow, uh, bloodborne exposure somehow um, from either close family members or neighbors. Uh, typically, uh, those who get chronic hep B uh, um, at this young age um, will get it um, as a toddler. Um, again, those who come from the Southeast Asia and Far East are likely to get hep uh, chronic hepatitis B. Whereas those who get hepatitis B uh, from North America or Western Europe, they get more so acute hep B. Uh, and uh, it, those who get acute hepatitis B uh, as older adults uh, tend to fight it off, and therefore they don't develop chronic infection. Again, those who come from Southeast Asia or Sub-Saharan Africa who have chronic hepatitis B are the populations who are likely to have uh, end-stage liver disease and a risk of uh, hepatocellular carcinoma as a result of their uh, looking at the years, uh, you will see the incidence of new hepatitis B infections by year from 1980 over to 2013. And you'll see that the incidence was much higher back in the 80s. Uh, well, what changed was vaccination. And so uh, pre-1982 you know, or 1983, uh, we did not have a hepatitis B vaccine that was not administered. And since that time, basically everyone born uh, has been offered the hepatitis B vaccine. Women who are found to be pregnant are offered vaccination. Of course, when they give birth, they're offered vaccine. You know, the babies are offered vaccination as well. And so the hepatitis B incidence has really dropped uh, in terms of acute infections. However, what we are seeing, and we're also seeing this with the hepatitis C uh, population, is that even though we're making good headway with vaccination uh, and even great treatments with hepatitis C, because of the um, uh, uh, IV drug use and uh, pen, uh, endemic and as well as the narcotics uh, use that's uh, occurred over the past several years, we are starting to see an increase in, um, in rates uh, of acute infections. So it's not going away, but clearly the amount of uh, hepatitis C that we were seeing uh, is not nearly what it was uh, pre-vaccination. So um, how do you test for hepatitis B? Well, when a doctor orders tests for hepatitis B, they're actually ordering a, ordering a series of tests. 
Um, the first thing that they're going to order is what's called a hepatitis B surface antigen. Having a positive surface antigen basically is a marker of active infection. So if you're surface antigen positive, you have hepatitis B in one way or another actively. You're actively transmitting the virus, producing virus, and you can tra transmit it to other people. Um, the surface antigen does appear within one to 10 weeks of infection. Um, and then if the surface antigen lasts beyond six months, that doesn't indicate chronic infection. On the flip side, if you have what's called a hepatitis B surface antibody, that means uh, you are, uh, have developed immunity to the hepatitis B, whether it's because you got vaccination or you've had acute hepatitis B and your body fought it off, your immune system fought it off, and now you have what's called a resolved infection. Uh, the other thing that we can check uh, is what's called a core antibody, and that can come in either IgM or IgG form. The core IgM antibody, if it's positive, suggests acute hepatitis B infection. If you have a negative core IgM, but a positive core IgG core antibody, that suggests that, again, you have been exposed to hepatitis B at some point in time, whether or not you have active infection or whether or not you fought it off and now have uh, immunity. Um, the other thing that we also check for is what's called E antigen. E stands for envelope. And so uh, having a, a positive E antigen uh, for hepatitis B basically means that the, um, uh, the virus is replicating very, very quickly and in high numbers. And so oftentimes people who are E antigen positive have viral loads in the millions to hundreds of millions uh, versus if you are E antigen negative and you have chronic hepatitis B, then the viral load is much, much uh, less, typically only in the low thousands. Um, the natural history of hepatitis B uh, typically goes from an acute infection uh, to uh, a resolved infection, okay, if, if you're going to get over it. And typically what happens is you go from having a positive surface antigen and e antigen uh, positivity rate, and then over time, as uh, the body starts to fight it off, the e antigen uh, becomes negative and you get an antibody to that envelope uh, protein, and that's called e antibody positive. And then again, over time, the surface antigen should go from negative to positive as well. Once you reach that surface antibody positive surface antigen negative status, uh, and you have an E antibody or E antigen antibody positive, uh, that also suggests that you have a resolved infection. So looking at this table, um, uh, typically again, if you're surface antigen positive, core antibody positive, surface antibody negative, you have chronic hepatitis B. If you're surface antigen negative, but have core antibody positive and surface antibody positive, that means you have a past hepatitis B infection and that it is resolved. Uh, if you only have a surface antibody positive, but a negative core antibody and a negative surface antigen, that means you've gotten the vaccination. If all three are negative, that means you're uninfected and you have not gotten the vaccination. Okay? There are uh, rare instances nowadays where uh, some people can have an isolated, what's called an isolated core positive antibody, but yet the surface antigen negative and the surface antibody is negative. Typically, when we see these cases, that means they had been exposed to hepatitis B in the past, um, or it's a false positive. False positive rates in these instances are pretty rare nowadays, only because the assay that we use to test for this is so good uh, that we just don't see false positive rates anymore. Typically, in this scenario, what we see is it's just resulting from a past infection from so long ago that the body has just lost uh, antibodies. Uh, a way to clarify that would be to actually get a hepatitis B DNA testing and actually test for the viral load. If the viral load is negative and you have an isolated core antibody positive, again, we just assume that you had the infection a long, long time ago. So who are candidates for screening for hepatitis B? Well, typically people who have come and born uh, from high uh, or intermediate endemic areas, which is uh, defined as greater than 2% prevalence rate, uh, again, most often that is Southeast Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, or Eastern Europe. Um, U.S. Uh, individuals uh, or U.S. born children of in, uh, immigrants from high endemic areas. Okay, so even though, say, someone was born in this country, um, if the mother was from, say, Vietnam or China, um, again, uh, that is uh, someone who is born to a person who came from a high endemic endemic area and could have had uh, hepatitis B and therefore potentially passed it down to the child. 
So again, that person should be screened. Um, household or sexual context of people who have known hepatitis B uh, or active hepatitis B, persons who have ever injected drugs, people who have uh, multiple sexual partners or history of STDs, men who have sex with men, uh, inmates in uh, prisons or other correctional facilities, um, people who have uh, elevated, chronically uh, elevated liver enzymes for unknown uh, reasons should be tested for hepatitis B. Those who have been tested for HIV or um, hepatitis C and are positive for either one of those conditions should get hep B uh, testing as well as uh, they could be co-infected. Again, all those who are undergoing a hemodialysis should be tested uh, given just the high risk of um, uh, potential infection in dialysis centers. And of course, all pregnant women, regardless of vaccination status, should be tested just to make sure that they don't have chronic infection. So vaccination at the time of testing, um, patients uh, in settings uh, where universal vaccination is recommended, again, typically people, if you uh, have had an STD or HIV testing um, or in hospital-based settings or clinic-based settings, those people should be vaccinated for hepatitis B. Uh, those who um, have a history of drug abuse uh, should be uh, offered vaccination as well if they're not already immune. Uh, and again, uh, people who work in healthcare settings uh, that targets to patients who uh, uh, or people who use injection drugs or who are have other um, high risk behaviors again should be vaccinated and of course those who work in correctional facilities should be vaccinated as well. Um, the vaccine should be administered uh, at the same medical visit, visit uh, if at all possible uh, when you're getting them tested uh, unless there's a reason not to do that uh, and again um, uh, People should be directed to a venue where vaccination is recommended, but uh, testing is not feasible. Again, should be vaccination as well. Uh, there are two different types of vaccines that are currently available. Uh, one is called Engrix B, the other one is called HEPA-SLAV. Uh, both work well. The HEPA-SLAV uh, vaccination is the uh, two-series vaccination, whereas the Engrix B is the three-series vaccination. Um, and uh, uh, again, depending on where you are and what's available, um, either one of those should be sufficient. Um, there, uh, uh, people who uh, 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 should be fighting against hepatitis B infection. So again, the goals are to treat patients with chronic hepatitis B and prevent chronic hep B. Uh, you know, you interrupt the route of transmission. You want to immunize susceptible individuals. And of course, um, if you give vaccine to a uh, baby from a mother who has chronic hepatitis B, you want to get vaccine in that baby. Uh, this says within 24 hours, but really ideally within 12 hours of birth is, uh, is, uh, is best. Um, again, vaccination is the most effective uh, strategy to pre prevent individuals from contracting hepatitis B. So um, when do you test for hepatitis B in people who have had a history of, quote, vaccination? Uh, well, uh, basically people who, uh, even though they say they've had a vaccine, uh, even people who come from geographic areas where the prevalence is very high, uh, or US born persons not vaccinated as infants whose parents were born in regions of high endemic areas, uh, or if you have high risk uh, behaviors, again, even though they said they had vaccine, you should still test them just to make sure that they haven't been exposed uh, before they actually got the vaccine. Because if they were already exposed and they actually already have a chronic infection, getting a vaccine after a chronic infection will not help. They will still have chronic hepatitis B. Uh, it is also noteworthy that um, people who have that uh, anti, uh, you know, core antibody uh, positive uh, and the surface antibody positive, uh, they do not need a quote booster vaccination. They're already immune, so there's no need to give people those vaccines. So acute versus chronic hepatitis B. Uh, as I've said before, hepatitis B is transmitted uh, parenterally, <clears throat> which means it's a blood-borne pathogen. And that is usually transmitted either by sexual contact or by vertical transmission. The uh, incubation is usually tw between 28 and 180 days, uh, and patients may be completely asymptomatic throughout this phase. Um, in high endemic areas, as I've said, most transmissions are through vertical or maternal to infant transmission or horizontal from young children within the same household. Again, in lower endem endemic areas, such as in the United States, most transmissions occur in non-immunized persons who have high-risk behavior whether that's with sex or having drug abuse. Symptoms. So with acute infection, again, you can be completely asymptomatic. However, if you do have symptoms, uh, the most common symptoms are abdominal pain, nausea, jaundice, myalgias, 
uh, joint aches, uh, fatigue, fever. Um, a very rare percentage of patients who get acute hepatitis B will go on to develop acute liver failure. Um, that's less than 1%. Um, uh, oftentimes with acute hepatitis B, if you get your labs checked, um, or if you happen to have jaundice and you go in to see a doctor, oftentimes we'll see uh, elevated liver enzymes, that's the AST and the ALT, uh, potentially high bilirubin levels, and then uh, we may uh, see what's called an elevated INR, which is a measurement as to um, uh, liver function. Um, it's an indication of how well the liver is functioning. Uh, if the liver is not functioning well, or if it's very, very inflamed, that INR value will climb and it will be uh, high. And if it's very high, it can be actually a rather poor prognostic indicator of uh, someone even uh, potentially going on to develop severe injury or maybe even needing a liver transplant. For those who go on to develop chronic infection, uh, most commonly, uh, these people, again, are asymptomatic. Uh, but uh, again, people who do have symptoms, they go on to have just chronic fatigue, joint pains, uh, muscle pains. Um, but uh, some people with chronic hepatitis B may not even present with symptoms until they actually develop symptom, uh, with symptoms of cirrhosis uh, or even liver cancer. There are some what's called extrahepatic manifestations, which means people who have um, other organ involvement related to the hepatitis B. Uh, something uh, called polyarteritis nodosum, which is a chronic inflammation of the blood vessels uh, in the body. Uh, and then people can have uh, kidney problems uh, where they get kidney injury, uh, either acutely or chronically because of the chronic hepatitis B. In people who have acute hepatitis B, again, what will happen is they will get exposed at time zero, and then within you know, one week or two weeks after the exposure, they will start to develop uh, what's called the surface antigen, and they will make that E antigen as well. This is the time frame when they may have symptoms. Again, as the immune system kicks in and the body starts to fight it off, they will eventually go on to develop uh, antibody against this E antigen, and again, surface antigen falls, and they make antibody against um, the, um, the hepatitis B virus, first against the coronary body, and then eventually against the uh, surface antibody as positive. And again, once you get into this uh, surface antigen negative stage, phase and surface antibody positive stage, phase, um, that typically means that you have a resolved infection. And again, that can happen within a time span of uh, three months to maybe even six months. Uh, of acute exposure. So what is the natural progression of acute hepatitis B? Well, the final outcome typically is complete recovery. Uh, and again, that's most people uh, who get exposed to as adults will and get acute hepatitis B will have complete recovery. Um, if you go on to develop uh, chronic hepatitis B, uh, that can lead to cirrhosis or liver cancer. And again, those people who get exposed uh, when they're very, very young are the most at risk of developing uh, chronic hepatitis. To put a number on this, um, you know, if you get exposed as a uh, baby or as a toddler, um, your chances of getting chronic hepatitis B are about 90 to 95% uh, if you get exposed as a newborn and about 25% if you get exposed as a young, ch young child. Versus if you get exposed as an adult, um, your chances of getting uh, chronic hepatitis B are less than 5%. So again, if you get exposed to as an adult, uh, it's not nearly uh, as much of a chronic problem as it is if you get exposed as when you are a little baby. The natural history of chronic, chronic hepatitis B, uh, typically there are several different phases um, of the hepatitis B virus when we're talking about chronic hepatitis B. Again, the things that we look at, uh, we look at how high the viral uh, DNA level is and what the liver enzymes are, okay? Usually in people, who have uh, completely normal liver enzymes, okay, uh, and very high hepatitis B virus levels, typically in the millions, these are people who are in what's called um, a chronic infection, high rep replicative, low inflammatory state. The old terminology for this was immune tolerant, okay, uh, but now we call it just high replicative, replicative, low inflammatory state. Again, these people have very high levels of DNA, they have normal liver enzymes, they're often E antigen positive. Um, they have very little to no inflammation on a liver biopsy if you were to do one, and they have no scar tissue uh, if you were uh, to do uh, a biopsy, okay? These people in this state can typically just be observed and they don't necessarily need treatment. Progressing 
uh, you go from this uh, low inflammatory state to what's called an immune clearance state. Basically, these people will have uh, fluctuating levels of hepatitis B um, uh, virus. They can be higher, they can be lower, they can be going up and down. But the key here is, is that the, uh, something happens where the liver enzymes start to climb and you have active inflammation okay, of the virus and it's causing damage to the liver. And so if you were to biopsy these people, you would actually see evidence of um, significant inflammation or maybe even scar tissue in the liver. These people, if they go left untreated, who are in this stage, uh, may actually have high risk of going on to develop cirrhosis of the liver uh, or even liver cancer. Outside of this stage, people who then progress out of the immune clearance can go into what's called the E antigen negative chronic uh, hepatitis, uh, which is people who, again, um, uh, they're missing that E antigen, but they're still, you know, uh, they're still producing viremia or virus, and the DNA levels are are high, but maybe not as high as they were in this stage. Um, it's these people who. Again, if you biopsy them, they have ongoing inflammation and they may have fibrosis. Again, these people are at high risk of developing um, uh, cirrhosis or liver cancer if they're untreated for um, a large period of time. Moving on, uh, you can then progress into having what's called uh, inactive or non replicated uh, chronic hepatitis B. These people uh, will have very low levels of virus. The liver enzymes may be completely normal, but yet they're still hepatitis B uh, positive. Uh, but it is these people who, again, if you were to biopsy them, do not have a lot of inflammation and may have very little scar tissue. And these people can be uh, observed. And then finally, if you get lucky enough to where you lose the surface antigen, um, basically once that becomes negative, the liver enzymes become normal, the virus becomes undetectable, and that's when you are in this quote, resolved hepatitis B state. It is very important to know that this is not necessarily a linear progression. Not everyone will go through each one of these phases or stages in order. And in fact, some people may never go through uh, some of these, uh, these, these stages. And it's also important to keep in mind that some of these stages can last decades. Uh, people can remain in this high replicative, low inflammatory state for 10, 20, 30 years, potentially even longer, uh, without actually having significant liver disease. It's amazing. Um, in contrast, people can have, uh, in these chronic hepatitis uh, uh, phases, uh, also for many years, uh, and just not know it, um, and might, may not have any symptoms. And the only way that we pick it up is that if they come in and they have elevated liver enzymes, and we find that they're in this stage, okay? On the flip side, uh, people can go from this immune, you know, highly replicated state and progress to, you know, immediately this uh, eogen negative chronic hepatitis or this inactive um, uh, non-replicated replicated state. Uh, it does happen and we see it all the time. So to help us better determine what phase of the hepatitis B virus you are in, uh, the doctor needs to know how high the viral load is, what the liver enzymes are, and typically uh, if you're surface antigen positive or negative, or if you're e-antigen positive or negative. And that will help kind of put you in one of these categories. And depending on where you are, uh, really determines as to whether or not you need treatment or not. Again, this is a very similar diagram with uh, basically the same information. Again, looking at different phases, uh, going over what I just said, looking at uh, viral uh, DNA levels and uh, liver enzyme levels going through the different phases. So why is it important to identify people uh, who are uh, hepatitis B infected? Uh, well, uh, if we identify you early, we can typically intervene early, which means we can hopefully help prevent someone from developing severe liver disease or cirrhosis or liver cancer. Um, again, we're, we're constantly uh, checking um, hepatitis B viral loads uh, and liver enzymes. And if you need uh, liver cancer screening for HCC, we do that as well. Uh, we're also looking at uh, how much inflammation, how much scar tissue someone actually has who has chronic hepatitis B. All of this information is extremely important for us on how to best manage you as to whether or not you need immediate treatment or if we can just kind of observe you. 
Um, it is also recommended uh, to get hepatitis A vaccination if you are not already immune to hepatitis A to help with that batch as well. And it also is recommended that we avoid um, excessive alcohol use. And certainly if you're a cirrhotic, then you avoid alcohol completely to help prevent uh, risk of uh, disease progression. So what are some barriers in uh, helping to prevent and control hepatitis B? Well, a lot of it is lack of knowledge and awareness about the virus itself. Um, this is uh, not only through um, the community, but also certain healthcare uh, and social service providers may not know enough about it. And so really education is key, not only to uh, healthcare providers, but also to at-risk populations uh, in the public, such as those of people who have high-risk behaviors, whether it be high-risk sexual behavior or you know, intravenous drug use. Um, and also that there's also um, there's an insufficient lack of understanding about the extent and seriousness of a public health problem. Again, going back to one of some of my initial slides, people just don't know enough about hepatitis B and don't have any idea as to how prevalent the virus actually is. And so therefore, it's not really in their mind. Um, in terms of chronic infection, again, you know, about 250 million people worldwide are infected, only about 8% are diagnosed, less than 1% are actually on treatment. Um, of these people who are chronic infection, around 20 to 30% will go on to develop cirrhosis and, and, and or uh, liver cancer. And of these people, about a million people per year may die because of hepatitis B-related instances. Uh, so again, it is very, very common. Uh, this is just a pathology slide. Um, if we were to do a liver biopsy of your liver in someone with hepatitis B, um, in terms of looking at uh, stages of scar tissue or fibrosis, this is what we are. This is completely normal. Um, blue equals scar tissue. And so the more blue you have, the more scar tissue or fibrosis you have. So stage one is a little bit of scar tissue. Uh, stage two is a little more. Stage three, you start getting scar tissue between uh, uh, different bands of the liver. And then stage four is what's called cirrhosis, whereas you start actually getting um, nodules of scar tissue that encompass normal liver cells. Okay. And so what is the actual impact of hepatitis B? Um, well, again, people with chronic hepatitis B that goes uncontrolled uh, may go on to develop cirrhosis um, and may go on to develop uh, uh, liver cancer, which can lead to death, okay? Or decompensated cirrhosis, which leads to, again, potentially death or a liver transplant. So again, uh, how do we test for hepatitis B? And what does someone need when they test positive for hepatitis B? Uh, in everyone that we get, we get a surface antigen, we get a core antibody, we get a surface antibody. And again, this tells us what phase of hepatitis B you are in, okay? Um, it is actual, uh, we need to note that hepatitis B technically is not 100% curable, okay? Um, even in people who have a quote, resolved infection and the immune system fights it off, there are still little markers of little pieces of what's called closed circular uh, hepatitis B DNA that are hiding out in organs of your body. It's just that the, um, the body's immune system is keeping it suppressed so that it is not active and you're not causing any damage to your body and you're not spreading it. However, it is still kind of there. Um, so there is no, again, natural immunity. It's not like other viruses where you get it once and then it goes away uh, completely and you can never get it again, okay? Uh, there's always little bits of DNA that are remain in the body in someone who has a resolved infection. It's just that the immune system is keeping it under wraps. Um, there are instances where the immune system gets suppressed and you can have what's called reactivation of hepatitis B. Typically, those are people who get high doses of steroids or chemotherapy agents. Um, or other medications that suppress the immune system uh, to where you lose that control and the virus can reactivate. So what else do we test for in people who are uh, surface antigen positive? Well, we look for these uh, e antigen uh, levels. We look at DNA. Everyone gets at least some degree of imaging of their liver, whether that's an ultrasound or a CT scan. Typically, ultrasound is the first go-to because it's quick and easy and relatively cheap. We always test for hepatitis C and HIV just to make sure that they're not co-infected. Uh, we look at liver enzymes, um, we look at liver function, we look at your blood counts to make sure that you're not anemic or you don't have variable platelets. Uh, we also look at whether or not you're at risk of having fatty liver disease uh, uh, with hepatitis B just because the incidence of fatty liver disease and chronic hepatitis B is growing. Uh, we, and then we also want to stage fibrosis. 
um, looking at scar tissue in the liver. In most, day, in most instances, you know, in, in years before, we would do an, a liver biopsy to stage fibrosis. Nowadays, we don't really do that as much. Uh, we tend to um, do non-invasive means of fibrosis assessment. That can be using certain blood tests or what's called a fibro scan, which again looks for liver stiffness um, of the liver. We also test for hepatitis delta, uh, just because hepatitis delta can be co-infected with hepatitis B as well. And if you have a hepatitis delta co-infection, that can sometimes mean a more uh, significant disease and risk for disease progression. Okay. We also look at whether or not someone has a family history of liver cancer, if they use alcohol, um, if they're pregnant, and clearly um, if they have brothers and sisters or parents who uh, may have been exposed to hepatitis B, we always recommend that they get tested as well if there's concern for um, someone getting exposed by a maternal or fetal transmission. And again, we do a liver biopsy if we're unsure of what exactly what's going on or if we're really unclear as to how much scar tissue someone has. So what is a fibro scan? Well, it's a liver st stiffness assessment. Typically what we do is we uh, put a probe over the liver. Uh, as you press the button, the vibration waves get sent across the liver. And then depending on how stiff the liver is, it affects the speed of those waves coming back to the probe and it spits out numbers. Um, the stiffer the liver is typically means the more scar tissue or fibrosis someone has, all right? So usually, uh, depending on how high the liver enzymes are, it affects the readings of, uh, of the fibro scan, which can um, determine how much scar tissue someone has. Typically less than five is you know, no significant scar tissue. Anything greater than nine uh, is usually suggests advanced fibrosis or possibly even cirrhosis of the liver. Again, depending on whether your liver enzymes are normal or, or are elevated. For those people who kind of fall in this what's called gray zone where it's an indeterminate value, those are the people that we could consider a liver biopsy to help further stage their fibrosis. Uh, but using technology such as FibroScan or what's called MR elastography, um, you know, we really can avoid liver biopsy in the vast majority of individuals with, with chronic hepatitis B. Um, this data suggests, you know, 60% of the biopsies can be uh, averted. I would say that's probably even higher, uh, given how good the um, non-invasive liver assessment uh, systems are, uh, how widespread in use they are nowadays. In people with chronic hepatitis B, we also have to consider that there is a risk of what's called hepatocellular carcinoma, or HCC. Um, again, Hep B is the leading etiologic factor for, hep for HCC worldwide. Uh, and cirrhosis is the single biggest risk. So up to 30 to 40 percent of people with hepatitis B and cirrhosis may go on to develop liver cancer at some point. What are some risk factors? Well, uh, risk factors are being male, older age, um, uh, coming from sub-Saharan Africa or Asia uh, versus the Western world, um, how long you've had the disease, uh, how high the viral loads are, and if you have a family history of HCC. All of these uh, things, you know, Group together or individually can increase your relative risk. Uh, so as you can see on this chart, for every 10 years increase, you are an age of having hepatitis B, uh, your relative risk increases by 1.7. If you have a family history of HCC, your relative risk of having uh, liver cancer is about two and a half times greater. So it's a big deal. And of course, the higher uh, viral uh, uh, load you have, again, that significantly increases your risk too. Specifically looking at surface antigen level, we can measure how much surface antigen someone has in their body. And those who have much higher levels of surface antigen, again, increases your risk for, hepatitis, or for um, HCC too. Um, looking at um, hepatitis B DNA levels and long-term outcomes. Again, this reinforces the point that the higher your hepatitis B level uh, viral load is and for how long it is, really helps shape how uh, much at risk you are of developing either liver cancer or cirrhosis. So if you have a hepatitis B viral load that's greater than a million uh, for many, many years, over time, your risk of developing liver cancer is about 14% in this study, cumulative incidence about 14%, but the risk of developing cirrhosis is about 36%. Uh, compare that to having very low levels of hepatitis B DNA, and your risk is obviously much, much lower. So who do we screen for liver cancer? Well, 
the AASLD, which is the American Society for the Study of Liver Disease, uh, recommends that all patients with cirrhosis get screened for HCC. Anyone with a first degree family member with, uh, with history of HCC should get be screened. Uh, Asian males or uh, uh, black men older than age 40 or Asian women older than age 50 should be screened. Anyone who is co-infected with hepatitis delta, again, should be screened just because the risk is that much higher. And how do we screen? Well, we screen uh, ideally with ultrasound, with or without a tumor marker called AFP every six months. That is the formal recommendation by the AASLD. Um, you know, uh, some of us do like to try and screen with MRI or CT of the liver, just because we feel that uh, sometimes those images in certain populations are a bit better than images that you get with an ultrasound. Um, however, the technical recommendation is at minimum an ultrasound with or without AFP every six months. So who do you treat for hepatitis B? Well, you know, as I said before, generally um, in acute hepatitis B, treatment is not indicated because the vast majority of individuals will uh, get over the virus and go into what's called this resolved, uh, uh, resolved state. Um, the exceptions to that are those people who do end up presenting with acute liver failure. So people who have acute liver injury um, have a, what's called a high INR or coagulopathy, and they have what's called hepatic encephalopathy. Those who present in that fashion have a very poor prognostic indicator um, and are at high risk of dying without a liver transplant. Uh, but those people should also be started on treatment for that B as well. Um, again, uh, and if you don't have actual liver failure, Again, more commonly, if you just have a protra uh, protracted severe acute hepatitis lasting more than four weeks, if you're very symptomatic, if things aren't really getting better, um, again, those are the people who you can, can consider putting on treatment as well. If you are going to treat them, the most common treatments that we have nowadays is either with tenofovir or entecavir. Uh, they are uh, oral medications that can be taken once per day, and they are very, very successful. Um, in the acute hepatitis B population, uh, taking these medications, if you start them, um, you know, have a very good chance of um, converting, going from what's called a surface antigen positive to a negative status, and therefore going into a resolved infection. Again, that is in the acute setting. It's very different in the chronic setting, um, where people who have had chronic hepatitis B for many, many years, those people are less likely to go into spontaneous recovery. Um, so, um, you know, who do you treat for people with chronic hepatitis B? Well, again, not everyone needs treatment. You only treat when there's high suspicion uh, or evidence of ongoing inflammation and fibrosis. And so in these uh, individuals, you consider e-antigen status, uh, liver enzyme level, which is the ALT, and the viral DNA level. Um, in people who you are going to treat, okay, um, older medications that were on the market, something called lamivudine, tamivudine, adofavir, um, although they are still out there uh, throughout the world, we do not really use these medications in the United States anymore uh, as because they don't work nearly as well and they have very high rates of resistance over time. Um, you can consider using what's called peg, uh, pegylated interferon. Um, I will tell you though that not many people choose this option. It's an injection once a week for about 48 to 52 weeks. Um, there are many, many symptoms to pegylated interferon. Uh, and the rates of uh, seroconversion going from a positive to negative status, although are higher than if we use oral medications, they're still not anything great. And we'll, we'll uh, see that in just a little bit in one of the next couple slides. Uh, so uh, again, a lot of symptoms with that medication, and it's really only good for people who meet certain criteria, okay? Most commonly, if we're going to treat someone for chronic hepatitis B, we're going to put them on either what's called entecavir or tenofovir-based therapy. Tenofovir comes in two forms. Uh, TDF is the older version. Uh, TAF is the newer version that we're now using. Uh, again, all three of those work exceptionally well uh, to uh, suppress the virus to undetectable levels and actually to normalize liver enzymes. So, um, you know, what, what do we get if we start someone on therapy? Well, uh, what we get is efficacy e using either entecavir or tenofovir based therapies. We get very potent viral suppression. We get a, a reversal or improvement in hepatic inflammation and fibrosis and cirrhosis. And even people who actually have severe fibrosis pre-treatment, five years after starting these medications, the amount of scar tissue 
uh, significantly can regress. Uh, and so it really helps prevent progression of disease. What's limited about these medications? Well, these medications don't do so well in converting, going from that surface antigen positive status to that surface antigen negative status. Um, it does decrease, but it does not completely eliminate the risk of liver cancer, okay? And typically people, once we start medications, are on them lifelong, you know, indefinitely to maintain the benefits, which again does result in some high uh, drug costs, some potential drug resistance, although that's extremely rare, uh, and then potentially some adverse side effects, uh, which again are also very rare. So how do you define the cure for hepatitis B? Well, we separate that into functional cure and what's called complete cure. A complete cure is really, it is associated with um, uh, not only just, uh, you know, very low risk or if not zero risk of liver disease progression or HCC and surface engine seroconversion, but you also get what's called this uh, closed circular DNA eradication. Um, we cannot, at this point in time, provide a complete cure, again, because even if you get to a point where you get to a surface antigen negative status and have a quote resolved infection, that closed circular DNA is always going to be there. Okay, it's just that your body keeps it under control. More likely, though, we're going to get to what's called a functional cure. All right, a functional cure again still gets you the benefit of uh, you know risk of disease progression and a reduced risk of HCC, um, and people can live completely normal and healthy lives. Uh, with a functional cure, it's just, and you can even get surface antigen zero conversion, it's just that you don't get this complete eradication of the circular DNA, so it's always there. Functional cure is what we're kind of aiming for nowadays. Um, there clearly is research going on to try and find ways to um, get to that complete cure and completely eradicating this closed circular DNA. Um, however, we're not there yet. Oops, I'm sorry. My apologies. My apologies. Okay. Hmm. Not sure what's going on here. Uh, I seem to be going in and out of mode. Sorry about that. Um, so again, factors that favor monitoring versus favors uh, factors that favor treatment. Um, again, people who are uh, where we can monitor are those people who are kind of in this what's called um, you know, immune tolerance state or highly replicative, replicated state where the virus is very, very high, but the liver enzymes are completely normal. These are people that we don't really need to uh, uh, treat. Again, people in this low replicative state, um, again, um, virus is very low, but detectable, but still in normal liver enzymes. People who we definitely need to treat are people who have acute inflammation, elevated liver enzymes, high viral loads of, DNA, of uh, viral DNA, um, those people we definitely treat. Um, people who are pregnant or women who are pregnant who have very high viral loads, we will often put them on treatment to help reduce the risk of maternal to fetal transmission. Um, and also people who are on certain medications that suppress the immune system, uh, we may offer them treatment as well in order to help prevent what's called reactivation. So again, these are just the guidelines put out by the AASLD as to who to treat and who to observe. Uh, we separate this into people who are EN engine positive, um, again, non serotic patients. Uh, if liver enzymes are very low, uh, but the viral load is very high, you can watch these. If the liver enzymes are very high and the viral load is high, you can treat those people. Okay? If they fall into the gray box uh, or this middle box here, there are certain criteria that we use to determine as to whether or not treatment should or, or could be beneficial. If they are EN engine negative, again, if they have. Um, um, liver enzymes that are completely normal um, and a viral load less than 2,000, we watch those. Um, you know, if it's greater than 2,000, but again, still liver enzymes that are totally normal, we watch these people as well. If the liver enzymes are greater than two times that below the normal and have a high viral load greater than 2,000, we offer these people treatment. If again, you kind of fall somewhere in the middle, um, these are the people who are oftentimes looking at how much inflammation and how much fibrosis they may have. So we'll be considering fiber scans in these people or possibly even liver biopsy if, if uh, the non-invasive route of determining fibrosis is inconclusive. So in general, hep B DNA greater than 2000, elevated liver enzymes, and typically that's an ALT over um, 25 in women and 35 in men. Um, 
if you're older age and have active liver disease, if you're very high risk of HCC or a family risk of HCC, um, or clearly if you're cirrhotic, um, then we offer treatment regardless. Okay. So uh, looking at different therapies that are available, um, we have, as I said, peginiferon and tecavir, and then the tenofovir-based therapies. Again, if you're using peginiferon, um, you're looking at weekly dosing for at least a year. Very, very high incidence of side effects. Uh, I basically tell people that they're going to feel like they have the flu or coronavirus for an entire year. And so when you tell them that, it's not generally a very popular uh, medication that people want to go on. Um, versus taking a pill once a day um, with very minimal side effects and typically works pretty well uh, to uh, suppress the virus and make people feel better and to help prevent risk of disease. So I would say the vast majority of individuals that we treat for hepatitis B, we're putting on one of these oral therapies uh, to treat them. Uh, looking at efficacy um, in eonogen positive versus eonogen negative uh, people, um, you know, again, as I said before, if you are going to use interferon, interferon does technically have the highest risk of um, seroconversion. They get a higher rate of eonogen seroconversion and a much higher rate of surface antigen seroconversion as compared to a tecavir or tenofovir-based therapies where they're much, much lower. If you're eonogen negative, again, you have lower rates of seroconversion uh, than if you were antigen positive and you were starting therapy. But still, again, looking at surface antigen uh, loss, you know, on therapy, if you're on tenofovir and tecavir, we're talking about 1% per year um, or less than 1% per year uh, risk of improvement in uh, surface antigen loss, which is very rare, although it does happen. Can therapy ever be stopped? Um, historically, uh, nucleotide therapy is continued indefinitely unless there is loss of surface antigen. Um, if you stop therapy too early, you run the risk of what's called a hepatitis B flare, which is uh, um, classified as having acute liver injury or possibly even failure, uh, fibrosis progression, or HCC. Um, I can tell you that at least in our center, we have seen a couple people within the past few years who had hepatitis B. Uh, flares going into liver failure and needing liver transplantation, liver transplantation because they stopped their medications, okay? Nearly all patients will have an increase in liver enzymes if they do flare or hepatitis B viral load if therapy is stopped in the absence of uh, surface antigen seroconversion. Um, who are at lower risk of flaring uh, if you're going to stop therapy? Um, well, we have done studies on people where we have stopped therapy and watched individuals uh, to see how long and how well they do. The people, who, if you are going to stop therapy, the people who do best are those who've been on therapy for at least four to five years with undetectable hepatitis B viral loads and completely normal liver enzymes. Again, their eonogen status negative, and if you measure their surface antigen uh, level, it's less than 100. If you meet all three of these criteria, you can consider taking them off therapy, but you have to watch them very, very closely. Um, labs monthly for a while, and then uh, at least every three to six months, uh, just because of the risk of having a flare down the line. Um, and so we have looked at this as to what is the risk of flaring down the line and how common does it actually happen? Um, uh, those rates, uh, depending on what you read and the studies that you read vary, um, you know, anywhere uh, as high as up to 50 to 60 percent. Um, this past weekend was the AASLD liver meeting, and so um, the next two things that I'm going to show you are two abstracts uh, that actually addressed this issue and what the true uh, risk was. And so in this study, uh, they took virally suppressed chronic hepatitis B patients who stopped therapy. They were all antigen negative. Uh, all 945 patients, the vast majority were on either tecavir or tenofovir prior to stopping therapy. 50% um, of the people who still were stopped therapy um, within the first year had elevations of their viral load and or liver enzymes. Um, uh, those who uh, did not get surface antigen loss uh, went on therapy or off therapy. Uh, only about 20% maintained remission at four years and then 43% had to restart treatment. So as you can follow this graph out here, again, um, uh, the farther you get out, 
the number of patients in remission, these green lines here, goes down significantly, and the number of people who need treatment, which is the red line, go up significantly. So again, about four years, only about 20% of people are gonna maintain remission off therapy. And when I say remission, I mean normal liver enzymes and completely undetectable uh, hepatitis B viral loads. Similarly, uh, another group uh, looked at um, uh, over 10,000 people, uh, either on antecavir or tenofovir for at least one year. And then this therapy was stopped, again, because of some sort of government issued, you know, law or, or something uh, in Taiwan, where basically the patients were not able to get medications anymore. 70% um, were male, about 10% were cirrhotic. Um, you will see uh, that a flare was defined in this study as a liver enzyme greater than five times the upper limit of normal and a bilirubin greater than two. Um, and at four, year, at four years, um, about 6.58% of people um, uh, had evidence of a flare that met this strict criteria, okay? More people uh, had less severe uh, elevations of liver enzymes and uh, bilirubin levels, uh, but again, at least 6.5% uh, that's, you know, their definition of a flare. Of these people, about 13% needed a liver transplant as a result of their flare, and 43 patients actually died within six months following the flare, uh, which giving it a mortality rate of about 0.63%, which, again, in, you know, 10,000 individuals, nothing to shake a stick at, okay? Factors that predicted the flare were older age, presence of cirrhosis, male sex, and again, history of the, uh, a prior uh, liver decompensation which is indicative of uh, uh, cirrhosis. So in conclusion, um, hepatitis B is a worldwide prevalent and underdiagnosed uh, condition in most areas. Acute infection as an adult is generally self-resolving without chronic sequela. For those with chronic hepatitis B, only functional cure is attainable. Again, we cannot completely cure it um, because everyone still has those closed circular DNAs uh, that still in the, are in the system, even with a uh, resolved you know, infection. Um, hepatitis B has multiple different stages, uh, and depending on what you, stage a person is in, uh, it uh, helps determine as to what the risk is for cirrhosis, liver cancer, and death. Um, for those who do have chronic hepatitis B, it can be well controlled with therapy uh, in the population who need it, as it does reduce the risk of disease progression in liver cancer. Um, oral therapy is typically indefinite once started, unless stopped in exceptional circumstances. And again, finally, vaccination is key. And so if you have not been tested for hepatitis B, and if you're not vaccinated, again, to help reduce the risk of uh, uh, prevalence and, and infections, please get yourself vaccinated. All right. Um, that is the end of my presentation. Uh, I thank you very much. Uh, I hope you enjoyed yourselves, and I'm happy to entertain any questions if there are. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Dicing. That was a very um, comprehensive journey through hepatitis B and all the different phases of hepatitis B as well as the treatment options. Um, I'm interested to know, uh, you know, the, the role of interferon, obviously it's extremely toxic therapy, but if you have a patient who has a high risk for HCC, are those kind of patients that you might consider using interferon or, you know, I'm just trying to understand you yeah. know, if a patient wanted to deal with the side effects right. and looking at the success rates and, and thinking, well, I don't want to be on a pill every day or I want to get pregnant one day or something, sure. um, what what type of patient is going to be most is going to most benefit from interferon I, therapy? I, I think you have to look at someone who um, meets good criteria that has been well validated and studied where people have the best response to uh, interferon. Uh, that person is not cirrhotic, first of all. If you're cirrhotic, you, you really can't get interferon because there's a high risk of decompensation, right? Um, but the, the population who is best studied to respond best to interferon-based therapy are typically the people who have lower levels of the hepatitis B viral load, higher levels of, uh, of uh, ALT or liver enzymes, and are um, what's called the hepatitis B genotype A. I didn't really get into genotypes too much only because they're not really clinically re relevant anymore. Um, we don't use them uh, for hepatitis B anymore, uh, but they are there. Um, but if you are gonna genotype someone, genotype A responds the best, uh, better than B or C. 
Um, and so if you have that young patient who's well motivated, has a low level of DNA, high liver enzymes, and there's a genotype, a genotype A, and they don't have cirrhosis, that would be the ideal population to use uh, pegonephron in. Um, I can tell you that I have talked to people who've kind of fit that bill about that therapy because it's part of my consent process and, and, and how I treat people. Um, I have had no one actually take me up on the offer. <laughs> um, I, I don't know if Dr. Pakros has had someone um, recently, I should say recently, uh, use uh, interferon therapy outside of a clinical trial uh, because there are clinical trials uh, that do use interferon therapy uh, with other therapies as well. Um, especially if you have hepatitis delta. Um, right. Okay. But um, but yeah, outside of a clinical trial, I'm not sure how many people are actively choosing interferon-based therapy. No okay. Um, pregnant women, actually, I'm glad you brought this up. You know, the oral therapies such as entecavir, uh, well, actually not entecavir, I'm sorry. Um, the two therapies that are approved for pregnant women with hepatitis B are uh, tenofovir-based therapies called tenofovir difumarate or TDF as well as telbividine. Again, we don't really use telbividine in this country very much anymore, um, but tenofovir is very, very safe. Great. And then are you using more and more uh, tenofovir alafenamide then? Like, do you start patients off yes. in with alafenamide? Yes, uh -huh. I am. Uh, the main reason to use the, the, the newer version of tenofovir alafenamide over the older version is because um, it's different, um, it's cleared differently. And so because of its pharmacokinetics and how it's cleared, it doesn't cause as much uh, kidney damage. Not that TDF caused a lot of kidney damage in, you know, at baseline, but clearly there was some risk and we had to monitor patients' kidney function while they were on that therapy. Um, but what we have found is that with the newer version, the tenofovir alafenamide or the TAF, uh, that has much less uh, risk of causing chronic kidney disease than the older version does. And um, it also um, decreases the risk of uh, bone density loss uh, as compared to the older version of uh, TDF as well. So for those reasons, I think most of us are probably using the newer version of Thothbeer, the TAF, over the TDF. Um, I have had, uh, if I'm going to start someone on Tenofovir, I'm, I'm preferentially choosing TAF uh, over TDF for, for those reasons. And then between Tenofovir and Entecavir, is there really no, no I don't think there's difference? much difference. Um, they're both very, very successful. They both have very high rates of um, barriers to resistance, and, and they both work equally as well. Um, for people who have prior exposure to older medications such as lamivudine or telvividine or adopavir, there has been some data that shows there's a little bit of cross resistance between entecavir and lamivudine and telvividine and adopavir. And so there might be a risk of um, resistance with the or with the uh, entecavir uh, in people who have had prior exposure to older medications. There has been no instance of uh, really resistance to the tenofovir based medications. So I would choose tenofovir over entecavir in people who have had prior exposure to lamivudine-based therapy, just for that specific reason. Okay, great. Okay, wonderful. Well, there aren't any other further questions from the audience. So I just wanna thank you again, Dr. Dysing, for a, an extremely um, comprehensive overview of hepatitis B. And um, I wanna thank our audience for attending and um, we hope you all have a good night. Thank you so much. Thank Take you care. so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.